It's wonderful to see you all here this morning. And it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to our third week, if I have my brain right, of um, Sacred Hour observances during the semester, but our first last lecture of this academic year. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Corday Goddard, Associate Dean of Student Development here at St. Norbert College. Corday is entering his 15th year, in the midst of his 15th year working here. I know that because we're from the same freshman class as far as coming here to work. Um, and Corday's uh, title is something about nice guys finishing third. And I don't know if that's true or not, we'll let him tell us, but I do know that he's a nice guy. I've known that for a long time. And I knew that um, recently when after Corday agreed to offer a last lecture um, with the understanding that he would strongly prefer to go in spring, um, <laughs> I had to get back in touch with him and say, how about not just fall, but the opener? <laughs> you know? So um, Corday graciously accepted. I promised him coffee and my firstborn. Um, <laughs> The firstborn goes off to college next year, so that's an expensive proposition for him, but I'm grateful, you know, so. Um, but anyway, um, I'm really thrilled that Corday has uh, offered to grace us with his uh, wisdom as we begin our last lecture series. For our students new to our community or any who haven't come to this before, last lectures are offered on college campuses uh, many places. And it's not something we invented, but it's something we're thrilled to be a part of. The basic idea is if the person standing here knew this was the last time they were able to address us, what might they want to say? And so that's the invitation we ask our lecturers to keep in mind as they share some wisdom. I'm grateful that Corday is speaking this morning. Uh, when I think about Corday, a few things pop to mind. One, I see him as a colleague who very much values the voices of others, his own colleagues as well as student voices. Corday, we're in a lot of meetings together. <laughs> Corday is a consistent advocate for what our students saying and what do we need to hear about the needs of our students. Um, more personally, I know that Corday can take what he dishes out um, and that's a good thing if you're stuck working with me. Um, and finally, I see in Corday a deep conviction that goodness can indeed prevail, that goodness can prevail in individuals, that goodness can prevail in situations, and that goodness can in fact prevail in institutions. And it's that sort of deep optimism that makes him a joy to work with. So let's get me out of the way and welcome for our first last lecture, Dr. Corday Goddard. Well, good morning, gosh, thanks so much, Julia. It's a wonderful introduction. Thanks everyone for being here. It's a privilege to be here, even at the very first, uh, first one of these this year. I've spoken in front of large groups before, um, and I'll talk about that in just a bit, but it's never quite as unsettling as looking out and seeing my colleagues in front of me and my boss. <laughs> so thanks for being here, Jay. <laughs> I have to tell you, I've been having this recurring dream. Now, I've had the dream over the course of a number of years, but I've had it several times recently. In the dream, I'm often seated next to or on the wings of a stage onto which I'm about to step in order, to deliver, in order for me to deliver my part of a series of dramatic vignettes. For some reason that I can never figure out while I'm having the dream, I'm part of a theatrical production involving many other actors. My part is never more than two lines of dialogue away. In the different versions of the dream, the content of my role changes. Sometimes it's spiritual, sometimes it's patriotic, sometimes it's dramatic, and sometimes it's a combination of all of those. Sometimes singing is involved. <laughs> and once there was an elephant. <laughs> but the scenario is always the same. The production is well underway, my turn is about to arrive, and I am furiously trying to memorize my part often trying to dream up a mnemonic device of some sort that might help me in all likelihood at least approximate something that's written on the page. In every version of the dream, there is a point where I suddenly realize I should have been more prepared than I am. Sometimes I'm alone, but most often I'm surrounded by some set of you, my colleagues, and occasionally a student from the past or the present. Sometimes other people in the dream are highly supportive, and sometimes not so much. 
always, the dream is terrifying. And it's always a great relief to awaken and eventually realize it has been just a dream. And But on the Saturday of Labor Day weekend, it was unsettling enough that I was compelled to get out of bed and begin writing at 5 a.m. what has become, for better or worse, today's last lecture. So we'll see how this goes. Now, if this is any consolation at all, my new colleague in the Counseling Center, Dr. Bruce Robertson, tells me that in his professional opinion, this can only mean one thing. I miss my mom. <laughs> well, as I've said, I've had the opportunity to speak in front of relatively large groups before. I speak during summer orientation. I've been part of other common prayer experiences. And in ways that still surprise me, I've actually been asked to deliver this sermon in my church on a number of occasions, something I know others of you have done as well. Now, that's not especially relevant to us today, except that when Julie invited me to speak with you, I spent a fair amount of time thinking about things I had shared in that context. I thought back to things I had tried that worked, things that didn't work as well as I had hoped, and to the one or two times I had to admit in hindsight, I lost my way a bit in the writing or in the delivery. There were times, a small number of times, I hope, where I got in the way of what I was trying to share. Now, my hope is that that doesn't happen for us this morning. But each time I'm asked to speak in that setting, I begin with the same premise. If this is the last time I'm ever asked to do this, what is it I'm to say that's worth saying? And what is it I'm going to say that needs to be said? And so Julie's very kind, very untimely invitation to take part in this event today had me thinking similar thoughts, given the nature of the opportunity as she described it. If I were to give one last lecture, the very last one I could ever give, what would I say? And I'll admit, in the very first few weeks of thinking about this, the only thought I had was, what in the world am I going to talk about? And that brings me back once again to my thoughts about those times when I spoke in my church. Now, fairly recently, my wife, who's joining us this morning, my wife shared an insight about the collective content of my work for the church. Now, she shared in a way that is perhaps unique to wives sharing feedback with their spouses. Now, what I think she meant to say was something along the lines of, <laughs> Corday, you've got tremendous insight and the ability to communicate hard truths to people who don't feel like listening to you. Your ability to pose questions that, will people, that people will actually ponder is inspiring, something like that. What she actually said <laughs> was, Corday, all you ever talk about is service. <laughs> now, when I inquired about what she meant by that, admittedly in a way that husbands respond to their wives with, she said that without regard for the lectionary reading upon which I was speaking, the personal stories I was sharing, or the conclusions I was hoping to help us draw, I always seem to circle back to this idea of service and serving. Now, I disputed her claim, and this time, maybe for the first time, I was right. <laughs> you see, out of 10 times I've been asked to speak to my church, only eight and a half times did I actually speak about service. <laughs> well, because of that, I'm not gonna fall into that trap again this morning. Today, I'm going a whole different direction. Today, I wanna talk about servant leadership. <laughs> now, three years ago, Dr. Wege and Dr. Sobain gave me the opportunity to teach in the leadership studies program, something that continues today as recently as about half an hour ago. And so there have been a number of occasions where I've had the opportunity to speak with others about this idea of leadership. Now, by a number of occasions, I mean I won't shut up about it. And so I'd ask you to please console my colleagues in the Division of Mission and Student Affairs who have to endure this from me on a regular basis. There are days when I get sick of hearing me talk about it, so I can only imagine what it's like to be in their shoes. But part of what I talk about when I talk about leadership is this idea of servant leadership. That's such an intriguing concept to me, especially in the concept, context of thinking about and reading about and speaking about leadership at this place. The essence of leadership comes from a novel by Herman Hesse called Journey to the East, this mystical tale of a group of travelers, a humble cook that accompanies them and then disappears, and the discovery later that the servant, the cook, was actually the leader of the group's whole organization. I won't go into detail about it, but that idea 
the leader of the group being this quiet, unassuming helper that has a greater purpose than is initially let on, that frames much of what I think about when I think about leadership and what I think about the things I aspire to do in that context. Now, more specifically, when we talk about servant leadership, we're talking about things like altruism and stewardship and justice and self-understanding. I don't mean to reduce this whole, this whole line of thinking to a list of traits, but I want you to have a sense of what it means when we talk about servant leadership from a leadership perspective. In that regard, I remember watching this TV movie, Brian's Song, one evening when I was young. This wasn't the first time the movie had aired, and I don't remember going out of my way to watch it. It was just on when I turned the TV on at a time when remote controls were scarce. <laughs> yeah, that's my way of saying I was too lazy to get up and change the channel. <laughs> I'd also recently fallen in love with football, and so anything about football I was going to watch. Now at the time, I'm sure I missed most of the truly compelling parts of that story, parts of the story that connect really deeply with this idea of servant leadership, but I do remember being struck by the deep friendship of Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo of the Chicago Bears. Now at the time I was living in Montana, so there was no local team. I was a passionate fan of the Dallas Cowboys. So today I might watch that movie with different eyes, with my new green and gold eyes, but at that time, it just wasn't a concern for me that Sayers and Piccolo had the unfortunate uh, misfortune of playing for that team. I might have even shed a few tears during Billy D. Williams', Billy D. Williams dramatic, climactic speech, but as an ubermanly Montana preteen, I doubt it. I was so moved by the film, though, that I sought out the book upon which it was based, Sayers' autobiographical book called I Am Third. The title for the book comes from Sayer's conviction that for his life to be appropriately balanced, it had to be ordered in a certain manner. And for Sayer's, the proper order was this. The Lord is first, my friends and family are second, and I am third. Now at the time, I wasn't an overly spiritual person. I hadn't grown up in the church. We hardly even made it at Christmas and Easter. But I do remember being jealous of friends who were part of a faith tradition. Even still, that just wasn't who I was at the time. But given that, the notion of God being first still stuck with me for whatever reason. So then when I found myself as a new professional working at a Jesuit Catholic university in Omaha, Nebraska, I began to understand what that might be about. And then as we started our family and felt called to connect with our own church community, I learned a little bit more. And then through a series of truly serendipitous events, I end up in this corner of Northeast Wisconsin at this Norbertine school connected to this wonderful little Presbyterian church just across the bridge. And it's there and here that I feel like I've finally gotten a glimpse of what Sayers was talking about. Though Sayers never uses the phrase servant leader that I can recall, his idea of me third seems to suggest actively, assertively connecting one's faith to serving the needs of others. It's that idea of humbly serving others in need as an expression of who we're called to be. And it's the clarity of vision that lets us see the elegance, grace, and dedication of those living saints among us, many of whom are in front of me this morning, those folks as role models and earth shakers and world changers. That intentional connection of faith, this notion of service, became more and more important to me as my children grew older and both are now enrolled in college. Now, I've not used the phrase servant leadership with them a great deal, but my hope is that they see the bulk of my life as service, service to this place, service to our church, service to other folks. My hope is that they might incorporate the noblest of what we've tried to do with and for them, and that maybe they'll, they'll let the other stuff slide. Without being modeling, it's my last lecture. I can share that I'm so proud and so humbled by the wonderful young adults my children are turning into, and they're not here, so I can say this, not in front of them. <laughs> I can share that I'm still not sure how that happened. Now, the idea that my family and friends are sandwiched in Sayer's list is comforting to me and seems to fit my notion of servant leadership, putting others' needs ahead of my own, and hopefully for them, putting others' needs before theirs. And at the end of the day, I think Sayer's was right. I am third. 
Along those lines, I'm occasionally asked how I would describe my own leadership style. I usually share that I would describe myself, me at my best, as a leader committed to what the author Jim Collins describes as level five leadership. For him, a level five leader possesses an equal mix of professional will and personal humility. Do what needs to be done, especially the hard stuff, but do it in a humble, selfless way. In my work, that means when I'm asked to serve, I feel like I should serve. And when there are opportunities for me to help us be the place we aspire to be, I hope I've been helpful. I hope I've helped make good teams better and better teams great. And I hope I've done anything I've done with a genuine sense of humility. Having said that, my willingness to even talk about all this is probably proof I haven't figured it out just yet. And don't get me wrong, I can't always pull this humble thing off. There have been moments of hubris or frustration that have not served me or my colleagues well. I imagine I should also note that others have sometimes perceived what I hope is humility as weakness or worse. It doesn't always work the way I want it to. But if I am third, and like I said, I think that's right, where does that leave me? Where does that leave all of us? Well, I'd like to finish this morning by going back to where I started today, not with this crazy dream, an elephant, really? <laughs> but back to my experience speaking with my church family. I won't get all churchy here, but I will share that in preparing to serve my church, I've always tried not to depart without leaving a challenge of some sort, a reminder of what we're called to do, each of us. In that context, I'm speaking with my church family, and today, of course, I'm speaking to our community. Now, Dr. King said that anyone can be great because anyone can serve, and in our leadership program, we teach that anyone can lead if they'll just choose to do so. Anyone can be great, anyone can serve, anyone can lead. Now, I can imagine what some of you may be thinking, and some of you have been kind enough to ask me this to my face. If anyone can serve or anyone can lead, then why isn't everyone a leader? And if everyone's a leader, who's going to follow? But that's the rub, right? Anyone can do all those things, but you know as well as I do that not everyone chooses to do those things. The reality is that there's not one of us, not a single one of us, that doesn't have the ability to do each of those things and to do them at a high level. There's not one of us that doesn't have the ability to do all those things at once if we'll just choose to do so. If we'll choose to do so. And so as we prepare to depart this morning, I would ask you to consider what choices you might make starting today, starting now. I'll bet for some of us, even still today, an opportunity is about to present itself that just needs someone to step up and seize it and make it happen. Is that you? Is today the day we choose to show some extra kindness or share some extra patience or shed some extra light in the dark places? Is today that day? Is today the day we help someone in our campus community or in the greater community find their voice or find their place or find their way? Is it? And it's today the day we choose to serve and to lead and to help us become the place we know we're called to be, to be the community we're called to be. I'll bet it is. Thank you. Thank you.